Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight. It's a remarkable turnout. My fellow panelists and discussants uh, taking their time to do this, wonderful. Um, I, I want to give a, a, a real nod of thanks to the organizers of the Veritas Forum who have worked very hard to make this happen and who were kind enough to invite me to partake of this opportunity. As I said, they, they work very hard to organize this. Um, I got an email a little while ago explaining how things would sort of go and the email started out by saying I would have uh, 10 or 15 minutes to make a sort of a short opening statement of some sort and then I might want to consider such things as describe your worldview, why did you become a scientist, where does truth seeking and science and life converge, what role has science taken in shaping your worldview? I only have eight minutes left. <laughs> It's going to be tricky, I'm afraid. <laughs> These are subjects that are not so simple, obviously, and may be better suited to a small dark room with a glass of absinthe, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try anyway. I want to note, by the way, that for some reason they've given me a bottle of smart water. <laughs> Nobody else got that. I'm wondering if that's a hint of some sort or another. <laughs> should, be, should be drinking it, I think. Um, so the mathematical biologist J.B.S. Haldane, a famous mathematical biologist in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, uh, once quipped that not only is the universe stranger than we imagine, it is stranger than we can imagine. And I, I, I love that quote for a long time. I don't like it so much anymore, but I love that quote for a long time because I thought it kind of put us in our Copernican place from a cognitive point of view too, so that just as from a Copernican worldview, we realize that we occupy no special place in the location-wise in the physical universe, maybe we also don't really deserve to think of having a, a, a cognitive landscape that's particularly special. Maybe there are things we can't know. Uh, certainly, we don't know a lot of things, and in the famous words of Donald Rumsfeld, we also don't know what we don't know, and that's even scarier. But, but it seems to me, I don't like this quote so much anymore because it seems to me it's turned out not to be true. Now, it may eventually become true, I don't know, but remarkably it hasn't been true. The, the universe hasn't been stranger than we can imagine. We've been remarkably up to the job. We imagine atoms that are invisible. We imagine a relativistic universe that, in which time and space are unintuitively not absolute. We somehow or another get close to comprehending a quantal universe of multi-universes in which cause and effect can be upended. Um, we, uh, we now have dark matter and dark energy which no one can see, touch, feel, measure or anything else but we're absolutely convinced must be 90% of everything that's here. Um, in biology, we have learned that we are all sitting here made up of trillions and trillions of cells and that remarkably 99% of those cells don't even belong to us. They inhabit our gut. So I'm not even sure what it means when I say I up here because there's a whole lot of freeloaders along with me it seems. <laughs> we see that evolution takes us from simple forms to very complex forms in a probabilistic kind of way, in a non-deterministic but yet seemingly ordered way. We see emergent properties in biological systems, consciousness for example. Um, we have reproduction by the very strange and somewhat snotty molecule DNA, very unlikely candidate to say the least. We now know that we can make organic substances from inorganic chemicals, something that really goes against the idea of vitalism and so forth, but was not thought possible until really just 150 or so years ago. So things have changed that way, and I think it's remarkable that we can continue to imagine this remarkable universe this way. I'd also like to quote a quote that I still do believe in from Douglas Adams, the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So you can be sure this will be good, you know, because... Adam says, there's a, there's a theory which states that if ever anybody discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There is also another theory that says this has already happened. <laughs> so, so let me talk for a moment about the scientific worldview, which for me is one of explanation, not necessarily of truth, especially with a capital T 
That may surprise some of you, I don't know. It may surprise some of my scientific friends. I don't feel that I'm in pursuit of truth with a capital T or any final answer. Science has not existed everywhere, nor at all times. It doesn't exist everywhere today. There are many cultures that live very happily without scientific effort among them. They may partake of some of science as goodies, but they don't really have a science as part of their culture, and, and people live very happily without it, and certainly throughout history, there hasn't always been science. There have been many starts, false starts, one might say, good starts, um, in ancient Greece, in Rome, the Egyptians, in, uh, in Arabia, China. Um, but somehow or another, these, these starts at science didn't get over the, the hump somehow or another in the way that science has flowered in the society that we find ourselves living in now. Um, it's, it's a view that I think is evidence-based. It is without authority, or it doesn't depend on authority. It's fallible. It remains uncertain. It remains vigorously uncertain. Indeed, I have to say that for me, the wonderful thing about science is that it as in no other, I believe, human activity or endeavor, revision is a victory. Revision is a triumph. It's not to be explained or worried about or an embarrassment or anything else. We are in the job of revising. Science admits of ignorance, of uh, doubt, of uncertainty, and of failure, and doesn't come up with despair. Instead, it finds in these things creativity, inspiration, and even a bunch of knowledge as it turns out. Um, Francois Jacob, the famous geneticist, French geneticist who died two years ago, uh, called a life in science, this life of questions, of the next experiment, of the next question. He said, I live in the future. That's where I'd like to live. Thank you. <laughs> My friends, it's uh, awesome to be here. Um, I love coming to Columbia. I love the math department here, personally. Uh, lots of friends. Uh, my old students are now grad students here finishing up their PhDs. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite places to come. It's an honor to be invited. Thanks for the Veritas Forum to taking care of all this, and especially for my two great colleagues. I'm especially excited about Professor Feinstein for the reason that not only is he a brilliant man, but he cares about sharing his work in a clear way. To me, that's, uh, you can't ask for more from a scientist. Really encouraging. You know, the great thing about college, you know, regardless of what you do, whether you're an artist or a mathematician like myself or a musician, is that now is the time to struggle with the big questions. What is the nature of reality? Is there a God? What does science have to say about all this? And the question I struggle with personally is, does math make me look fat? <laughs> Today, we're here to talk about these big ideas, right? God, science, meaning. But you know, each one of us has their own perspective of what meaning is. You know, there's different kinds of meanings. There's mathematical meaning. Let me show you my favorite one. This is the gauss bonnet theorem. It says that the integral, which means just add up, if you add up the total curvature over a surface, it's equal to 2 pi times the Euler characteristic, which means that if I take a sphere and add up all the curviness of the sphere, and no matter how I stretch it or pull it, the total curvature is always 2 pi times its Euler characteristic. Amazing thing. Some of you, like me, are getting turned on by the statement. That's great. <laughs> but most of you agree with Stephen Colbert when he says, equations are the devil sentences. <laughs> so where are we supposed to find meaning? Is it mathematical meaning? Maybe there's meaning in physics. Stephen Hawking, brilliant physicist, he writes, the universe does not have just a single existence or history, but rather every possible version of the universe exists simultaneously, the multiverse. Is this the true meaning of reality, the multiverse? You know, for thousands of years, the notion of truth and reality has been linked to the notion of a god. But today in 21st century America, certainly in the West, we no longer hold this reality to be true. It is no longer measured by church days or holy days or any special events about God himself. In fact, the belief is that the religion is no longer relevant. Religion is sort of like a scaffolding, right? You've got to believe in that stuff for a while until science comes and cleans it up. Then you don't need it anymore. Michio Kaku, brilliant physicist, writes, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from divinity. 
If you don't understand what's going on, you yeah, just wait. We'll take care of it. You don't need that notion of a god. Science is now the new measure of meaning. Black is the new white. Science is the new god. And today, we try to explain everything through science. One of my favorite mathematicians, philosophers, Burton Russell, writes, whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods. And what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. You see, my friends, we're putting all our chips in the science bucket. But here's the catch. I think science is not equipped to handle the full mess and complexity of life. See, we have a messy world, and I want to deal with messy things. I love messy things. Let me tell you a couple of messy things I love. First, ice cream. This is Grater's ice cream. Started in Cincinnati, Ohio, black raspberry chip. The chocolate chips are huge, but when you bite into them, it's soft. So much fat. Oh, it's delicious. Incredible. I love ice cream. Something else that's messy that I love, my family. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It all sounds cute. All sounds cute. Let me show you why this is messy. First of all, you notice next to me is my wife, who is, turns out, not Indian. Messiness number one. Right? <laughs> and then you have these two on the right, that one on the left. Their identity is totally screwed up. What are they? They don't know. <laughs> And then if you think somehow that's easy enough, then you have that little one on my lap. Here's what she looks like today. Right? Blonde haired, blue eyed dream girl, right? Oh my goodness, I cannot imagine what questions she's gonna ask me down the line. <laughs> I can't imagine how tough her life's gonna be in this kind of a weird setting, right? We're in America with a kid born in South India who grew up here, raising her up. Wow, it's a messy world. Listen, my friends, I love science. I get paid by it, right? We have wonderful tools to measure the world, to find patterns, to make predictions. I find no tension with science in my faith. Neither did Newton or Kepler, Galileo, James Maxwell. Great scientists and men of faith. Look, to me, science is just one language of measuring truth. It is one tool in a toolbox. Here's what Wittgenstein says. At the basis of the whole modern view, this enlightened view of the world, lies the illusion that the so-called laws of nature are the explanations of natural phenomena. He says, the laws of nature are great. That's what science does, allows us to find out what's going on. But that doesn't explain the big things, the nature of nature. You see, we must ask deeper questions than that alone, and we all do. And these questions are also being asked by the Columbia campus security on Friday night. They're asking, who are you? What are you doing here? <laughs> and where are you going? <laughs> you see, I want a model, I want a theory, I want a story that encompasses all these tools. I'm ambitious, all right? I want a theory of everything. And to deal with beauty and justice and relationships and significance, because you know what? We as humans value all those things. We value beauty. You know how I know we value beauty? Because I'm watching an ad for Victoria's Secrets. They don't put data charts on there. They put naked women. That's why we value beauty. We love those things. We value significance. We listen to Oprah, Deepak Chopra, listen to music, mysticism, because we thirst for something bigger. We value relationships. We go to football games and concerts because we want to partake of this with others. We value justice. You know, your heart burns when you watch 12 Years a Slave, when you watch The Godfather, when you want justice, retribution for the injustice done to us. You see, we are dealing with issues far larger in complexity than dark matter, genetics, and Gauss Bonnet. Science does not have a monopoly on reason. It does not have a monopoly on logic. We cannot be ignorant into thinking that Scientism, the belief that science is the only measurement of truth, or atheism, the belief that there is no God, are somehow above religious claims. To believe that there is no God, but at the same time to say that humans are important, that humans are moral, that humans are rational, that's an incredible statement of faith. I'm cool with that, but we have to admit that that's a statement of faith. And regardless of our ignorance, each one of us here, each one of us is a person of faith. Here's what David Foster Wallace writes. He says, there's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what we worship. You see, we must put our chips in some bucket. And not choosing to put your chips in any bucket, that's a choice. There is no neutral ground. Now to me, let me just close by saying that there's no story as satisfying in explaining all of this 
than the Christian worldview. Let me be clear, I don't believe in the Christian faith because it gives my life meaning or emotionally satisfies me. Look, I'm a math professor. There's no emotions to satisfy. <laughs> Look, the reason I believe in physics and the existence of forces and particles I cannot see because it is the best theory, the best story that explains the world around me, the physical world. Not because physics makes me happy. And the reason I'm a Christian, the belief in a God of history that I cannot see is because this is the best theory, the best story that explains the deep questions with me, this mess around me, the hunger for justice and beauty. So why do I find this faith really compelling? Let me tell you a couple of reasons. I'll be done. First of all, to me, the story is not one of morals or theories or philosophies, but is one grounded in the mess of history. It makes incredible historical claims and culminates in the resurrection of this guy named Jesus. Now, we can't use science to talk about history, but we can use historical tools. You can bear on it the weapons of history to test and see if it makes sense. And I think they do. And unlike any faith I know, the Christian faith boldly claims that the beautiful mess of this world that I love is built into the very heart of God. This is why God and the Christian faith is called Emmanuel, God with us in our mess, in our pain. And at the death of Jesus, it shows that the injustice that I find in this world has given a solution here. Most people think that love and wrath don't fit together, but I will have wrath if somebody hurts my baby girl because I love her. You see, the opposite of love is not wrath, but indifference. And at the cross, God is not indifferent. Jesus takes care of that for us. And stunningly, God shares in that responsibility. And finally, not just the death of Jesus, but the resurrection. It's not a spirit and a ghost resurrection, but a flesh and blood resurrection. And it shows that this physical world matters to God. Sex matters, flesh matters, ice cream matters, earth matters. Not about doing good deeds and going to heaven and singing a song to a magical God. Dear God, I hope not. But that this beautiful world will one day be set right. I want to close with one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite books, The Princess Bride. <laughs> it says, life is pain. Anyone that says different is selling something. You see, my friends, there are no easy answers. Using science is not a way to get out of jail free. That's still another choice that we're making. There's no way to remove the world and the faith we have in it of how to solve these big questions. I encourage you, wrestle with it. Don't be afraid to get messy. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about this. As you hear each other, I wonder what questions come to mind about the other's outlook. You know, what, what questions have you always wanted to ask an atheist or a Christian about his outlook that genuinely puzzles you? <laughs> Should we flip a coin here? <laughs> I, I can start first. I okay, just, I've been please. talking, so maybe I'll, I'll start something. Please, sure. Um, so I guess it had to do with something I mentioned, which is um, this notion of believing in no God, but yet having an incredible value given to mankind that we believe, you know, if we see a child crying if, for our own children, for people out in the world, that we do hold humanity to be important, that we want to redeem it, to take care of it. How, how do you wrestle with that or answer that question about, about where does the value of mankind come? Where's the goodness, the morality, the, the struggle of importance of mankind come when there's no God in that picture? I would actually take it a step further. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's just human kind or mankind that has value. I think all of living things have value. Um, so, and, and, and that's not, I think, often necessarily, I would say, a required religious view, for example, or part of many religions. It is a part of some. Um, and so that value can be there without recourse to God, a supreme being, a creator, or any of those things, I think there is an inherent value, and that value, I, I don't know, I, I guess I don't feel a need for an outside authority to tell me that there is that value. I experience that value, I think, as you do, mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. I value my family, I value my students, I uh, value people I work with, I, even like you guys, um, <laughs> so far. <Yeah. laughs> um, and I think we're, I, I, I mean, I guess I feel that, that if, uh, in questions of morality like that, like value or something, I think if, um, if we, religion disappeared tomorrow, we wouldn't all be valueless. The value wouldn't disappear with it. Um, I don't think there's any reason to believe that atheists are any less moral than, right. than believers of necessity, 
I mean, we've had plenty of immoral believers and we've had plenty of immoral atheists, but nobody has a lock on that, unfortunately. Yeah, so um, so I, don't see, I guess I don't see the necessity of it. I feel that, it, that value can exist without recourse to uh, without recourse to a creator or a supreme being. Let me invite a follow-up and then I'll give Stu the, the same right. Yeah, I, was just, uh, I was just curious because of reading Nietzsche, he really connects those two ideas up. Right? So he says basically, if you really do value mankind and really do value humans, then you really aren't an atheist. That's what Nietzsche's stance is in some sense. In other words, that if you're going to not have God, then the value of you know, the importance of man or importance of, I guess, um, any living thing is disconnected to him. So that, that's the only reason that I was curious about that statement. So, so pushing I, it from I think, a, I think it was Richard Feynman who sort of uh, came up with this sort of classification. And you don't have to agree with it. I'm not sure I agree with it entirely. He felt that religion sort of operated on three important levels, um, if I get this right, which he called a metaphysics, which is a way of describing the world. Mm -hmm from a religious point of view. Uh, ethics, which is a way of living in the world from a perhaps religious point of view. And then uh, inspiration, which is the motivation to do it. Mm. Uh, I think his, his, um, his logic or his argument was that from a metaphysics point of view, he preferred science as an explanation of the world that at one time or in some period of history or in some areas perhaps still religion gives a passable uh, explanation, but that science explanations for him seem to be better, or at least science is as good as religion at explaining. So metaphysics is a draw. Um, ethics, which is the question we're sort of talking about now, knowing what's right to do, he also felt was a draw, I think for the same arguments that I just made, which is if, I think we all believe also, even if there were no political laws tomorrow, let alone religious laws, we wouldn't all become robbers, rapists, murderers, and all the rest of that. I mean, that's just not how we would live. We've gotten to where we are because of, I would say, evolutionary considerations that, that, uh, that have us behave to some extent the way we do. Um, and so it finally comes down to inspiration. So the question is, where are you going to get your inspiration from? I think religion is a perfectly legitimate place to get inspiration from. There's absolutely no question in my mind. It's not for me, personally. I get inspiration out of science questions, out of the value of a world, out of a, an, a, an amazing puzzle that's out there, out of wanting to know, and out of sharing knowledge and things of that sort and being part of that whole thing. So for me, that's the inspiration, uh, where it comes from. And I, I guess I don't need an outside source. But I, I don't see any reason why religion doesn't have an absolutely proper role to fill, at least in inspiration. Stu, now let me return the favor and invite you to ask Satyan a question. Well, I guess I could ask you sort of, sort of the same question yeah. in reverse. I mean, you are a practicing scientist. Of course, I find that, I do find that difficult to figure out. Um, it, it, it's not like I wasn't religious at one time in my life. I was never wildly religious, you know, but I was brought up in a religious household. Um, we were, you know, well, we weren't Sunday church goers, but we were Saturday yeah. <laughs> synagogue goers, occasionally. Yeah. We were the high holiday types, you know. So, um, <laughs> but we paid our dues and all that, so it was, you know, it was okay. Um, so, I, but I had all the training. I yeah. was bar mitzvahed, you know, and all the rest of that. Mm -hmm. um, kicking and screaming, but nonetheless, <laughs> bar mitzvahed. So, so I... I I lived that life and, yeah. and so forth. And, but, then the, but then as I became a scientist and the science became more and more a part of my life, and in particular I have to feel as a biologist, I will say this, that I think the hardest of sciences to brook with, um, with religion, with a sort of religious beliefs is, is evolution. Hmm. I, can, I can sort of understand physicists who maintain a religious perspective or even maybe mathematicians. It's much harder for me to understand it from a biologist's perspective, even though I know biologists who are religious and that's fine. So I guess my question to you is how do you bring those things together? How do you make that work? So first of all, I'll just say the thing about evolution, which is um, I see no tension between, I, between evolution and scripture. So if somebody says to me, evolution is the way it happened, that's, you know, that's the way the, the world that God allowed it to happen, it wouldn't stun me at all. And I'm totally happy with, 
with that being the case. Um, I don't see Genesis in some sense as a tension with that thing. So I'm, it doesn't, uh, I have no issues with biological data that we have so far, right? Uh, but more importantly to me, the, because I have no tension with faith and religion in terms of biology, when I'm, looking at, when I'm looking at what science does offer, to me, it only offers certain things. Namely, it offers a better understanding, a clear set of tools to understand the laws of nature, but it doesn't address any of these other deeper questions. And to me, that's, that's why it's... Um, well, I'm sorry, so what are the questions, though? For example, um, the big questions that I was asking you about, who are we? What are we doing here? Right? These, and, and the fact that we as humanity notice and feel a sense of injustice or a sense of beauty in the world today, a sense of longing for relationships. And I see that science doesn't address these things. In other words, what it's doing, it's measuring, it's classifying, it's structuring, it's organizing, it's presenting. But it, it, historically, it's showing how we're related to one another but it doesn't address these deeper needs of who we are. And so, as a, I mean, as, my guess is as an atheist, one could solve, one could answer those in a certain way, and as a Christian, one can solve those in a certain way, as a Jew, one can solve those in a certain way, but, but those ways are all faith statements to me. In other words, those aren't built in through the laws of science. You're getting those from extrinsic values. So, uh, I have a sense it's a little bit of a straw man yeah, yeah. in this argument, in that I don't, I'm, I don't think science makes too many of those claims. I don't think science actually claims to be the only way to understand everything. Absolutely true. Um, I, I mean, actually, I think science is, in its better days, more humble than that. Absolutely true. It's not true. always so, Absolutely I admit, but, but in its better days, it's far more humble than that. And that the best scientists, as you know, is, is sort of my issue, yeah. think really about what they don't know and not yes. what they do know. They're not. One doesn't get proud because you made a discovery. You think, well, now what's the next thing to do here? You know, so um, so I think science is very involved in mystery yes, yes. and and all of those kinds of ideas. I I do think science can um, can, if you want it to, provide meaning. It can provide answers like, who am I or what am I doing here? They may not be as big an answer as the religious answer. Mm. I'll admit that, but. Um, but I think they're a perfectly acceptable answer. They're a good enough answer for, for me to live by and get on to the next thing. Indeed, I think in some cases, I would say the religious answer can hold you back mm. from getting on to the next thing. It's too big an yes. answer, as it were, for what we, I'd say not so humbly, think are such big questions, like who am I, like who yeah. gives a shit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, to no, some no. extent, right? That's fair. You know. No, that's fair. Well, I guess, I guess to me, I, uh, the reason I, I care about issues of faith is not because I have this need and I'm desperate to have it plugged in. Right? And somehow the Christian they just sing better songs, so it just fits in. That's not the point. The point is I actually think it's the truth. In other words, I think there's enough evidence out there to point to the fact that the story we see in the Jewish scriptures is fulfilled in the life of Christ and it's actually measurable in some sense and hence I buy it. Not because there's a, this gaping hole. Right? Well, that's sort of a scientific buy-in, isn't it? I mean, you're claiming that it's an evidence-based buy-in, yeah, that, that you buy into religion based on evidence. I do. That's certainly part of it. Without evidence, I wouldn't... I mean, for example, you give me 10 different texts, and they all say different ways of what it means to be morally good. Well, who am I to pick which one's right? And, and you give me no text, right? You give me the scientific one, which is like, hey, there's nothing. And I have to pick one. Well, what, are, what, are, what tools do I have to pick one? So if there's anything else that's testable out there for me, the fact about the Christian faith and the Judeo-Christian faith is there are some historical claims being made, and that's attractive to me, the so, fact you can so, actually do something to so it. So I'm going to put you on a hot seat if yeah, I Yeah, please, please. I'm, Does I'm this there. mean to you that, that other religious faiths do not have evidence? Um, well, if I do believe that there is truth with a capital T, then that means the Gaussian theorem is true and there are other things that are wrong. And what that means is that, that doesn't mean that the other faiths are, com so to say that all the other faiths are nothing is, com is dangerous and incorrect because we are all claiming to reach to God. We want something bigger because I believe God made us. So all these are, are ways of looking at and reaching to God. But I do think that the Judeo-Christian way is the true way, absolutely true. I would say that there is something right in math, and there is something wrong in math. So it is more right than the various other faiths. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, this is, for example, if somebody says, if the Christian faith says, let me tell you this, the Christian faith says Jesus 
is the Messiah that the Jewish faith has been asking for. The Islam faith says that is not true. The Jewish faith says that is not true. So somebody has to be right and somebody, you can't all say that's true, right? So one of it's right and other people are wrong. Well, we could all be wrong. That's certainly true. <laughs> that is certainly okay. true. Absolutely. That's true. I'm going to have right. some smart water now. No. <laughs> smart ass water. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, we're talking about evidence, so let me, uh, let me try a little thought experiment with you and see if it might give us a little um, a new, new perspective on this whole question of evidence. Satyan, let me start with you. I'd like you to imagine that there's a red button next to you, and if you push it, you'll immediately receive compelling evidence, not certainty, but compelling evidence, that you're wrong, that there really is no God. My question isn't... <laughs> <laughs> That's scary, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Speaking of hot seats. Yeah. Um, my question isn't do you believe there is such a button? My question is would you push it? Um, so let me see if I, so there's a button next to me. If I push it, you're going to give me not a guarantee, but a pretty compelling evidence that God does not exist. That's right. Oh, I'd love to push it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Say more. Um, okay, that's great. So, I mean, certainly my ego is wrapped up in all of this, as all of our egos are. In this, in this particular thing, let's pretend I, I wrote a math paper, which I, you know, and, and in, that, in that result I show that, um, gosh, that you can fold a piece of origami in a certain way, and there are only three ways of doing it, right? And I've kind of mathematically showed it to be true. And somebody comes to me and says, you push a button, and it'll turn out that the results in your paper are wrong. Like, you know, pretty conclusive. I would love to know why I messed up. Right? So, because I think one of the most dangerous things, especially your, your talk about ignorance that you talked about, Stuart, is that one of the most dangerous things we can do as scientists and as people of faith is to try to hide things when we're wrong. Right? Scientifically, I want to know why that paper is wrong. Is there another reason? Maybe they got it wrong. Maybe they didn't see a subtlety. Maybe that will lead to more newer, more beautiful results. So I'd love to know where the holes are. And to say that I 100% believe without a shadow of a doubt that the Christian faith is the only faith, that's silliness. Who am I to do that thing? And of course I struggle with those kind of things. But if I'm going to put a chips on something, that's the one I put the most on. That's the one that convinces me the most more than anything. And I'd love to be proven wrong and I want to learn more. Absolutely. So Stuart, let me uh, turn it over to you and ask, let's imagine you've got a blue button. <laughs> Oh, that's better. <laughs> uh, on your chair. And if you push it, you will uh, receive compelling, not total, but compelling evidence that you're wrong, that there is a God. And again, the question isn't do you believe there is such a button? The question is would you want to push that button? Absolutely. Why isn't there such a button? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't we come up with that button already? Um, Sure, for exactly the same reasons, I think, we all would like to know. Um, I'd like to know whether I'm right or wrong, and I don't really, in the end, in a, in a way, I don't care which. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm wrong for really good reasons, that's just as good as being right for good reasons, it's better than being right for wrong reasons or something like that. Um, so, sure, uh, uh, we'd all like to have surety. I think the real key is learning to live with uncertainty the learning, learning to live with doubt, with mystery, uh, with ignorance, if you will, and to be comfortable with that. There's a, a, the poet John Keats once uh, coined a term called negative capability. He felt this was the ability to live in a state of mystery and uh, a, um, a mystery, ignorance, and something else, unknowing, doubt, and so forth, with no irritableness, no reaching or irritableness about it. And he felt this was the most creative state to be in for a poet. I think also true for a scientist, for a mystic, for a religious person, um, whatever you are, I think learning to live in uncertainty because that's the reality, that's where we are, as much as we'd love a button, it's not going to be there. I just don't think it's ever going to really be there. And let me just invite you to chat about this for a moment. Satin? No, I think, yeah, I, um, I, was just, I was just trying to struggle with thinking about what it means to believe in God in a 100% setting, right? And, uh, and this notion of, are you always doubting? Are you always thinking about it once again? I was just thinking that the closest thing I have to try to describe my faith is, um, is the faith that the, the Christian faith isn't just a, 
believing in a set of things, but actually believing in a person, right? Believing that there's a God out there who wants to hang out with us, who was incarnate, and he's, he's here, right? He's my friend. And so to say that I don't buy that, well, as time goes on, it's like the best thing I could say is a relationship to my wife. You know, when I first met her, when I first got married to her, if you put her hand in mine, I, would, um, I wouldn't know if it was really her hand or some other woman's hand, you know. But now I'm married to her 17 years, and you put her hand in mine, and I, could, I know it's her hand. So when I first get to know God, do I believe he's true? Well, I've walked with him for 30, 35 years. So sure, there could be a button out there that, that could convince me otherwise. But man, it has to be pretty compelling, because I have this relationship. I, I know about his existence. See, that, that, so, so maybe that's a sort of an area of difference, in a yeah. way, because we lived with Newtonian mechanics for several hundred years yes. and got to know it pretty well. Yes. We still use it pretty much, right? Yes. But we also know at some moment it became wrong. Yes. It became fundamentally wrong, in fact, even though we continue to teach our children about absolute time and space as if we're correct mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and science, uh, and the famous words of, I think it was the economist Milton Keynes who said, when uh, somebody asked him how come he changed his mind, he said, well, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? You know? Uh, and that, I think, is, is the difference in a way with science. It, familiarity does not uh, breed in any way uh, um, greater acceptance necessarily. In fact, the longer something is around, the more it gets tested. It gets beat up as much as one can possibly beat it up. This mm. is the idea of science, is to take what is familiar and try and beat up on it, if you will. And I think that's the yeah. power of it for yeah. me. But at the same time, just to push back a little bit, the, if, since the Christian, Judeo-Christian faith is so much based on historical notions, that that beating up certainly does occur, right? So in the sense, in, in the sense of literature, right, you look at scripture now and you say, hey, does it, you claim that Shakespeare is great because of these tools of literature. Well, you, you claim this is scripture, God inspired. Does it hold water in terms of literature? We've developed new tools, not scientific tools, but tools in linguistics tools in the work of literature to beat that up to see can it survive. We develop new tools in history to beat that up to see do these claims hold. So I think those, that does happen. From a personal setting, I'm not a linguist, I'm not a literary scholar, but, uh, but this button was a personal button. So to me, I am excited to know if I am wrong. Oh, just, to be, yeah. just to be clear, you're talking about New Testament claims or Old Testament claims? I'm talking about both. So historically speaking, I mean, do you believe the flood was a historical event? That's a great that question. Sense? That's a great question. So I'll be honest with you. Genesis 11 and before is a little fuzzy. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but that's the, yeah. it's kind of all built on that. <laughs> it's true. No, it's true. I agree. I agree. So, I mean, in, in clearly the way scripture is written from Genesis 1 through 11, the continuity of that does not end at Genesis 12. But clearly in terms of what is being said, there's an incredible mark of Genesis 12 when Abraham is introduced. So all of a sudden the story starts from these couple of people, Adam and, and goes to a huge humanity and narrows right down again. So there's a huge turning point and I would, I would say it's written in a very different way. Now, I do want to give this one caveat. To read Old Testament and New Testament as a work of a New York Times news reporter as an enlightened scientific document is dangerous. Because it was never meant like that, right? It was never meant, now I'm here at the flood, it's 17 feet, and, right? It's not meant like that. So, so for us, to, for us as, even as scientists and as people of faith, to look at the scripture and say, wow, it says 17 here, but now it says 40. You know, these guys are getting it wrong, throw the whole thing out. That's a bit dangerous. It's written in a certain context. That doesn't mean it doesn't have truth. That doesn't mean it's not historical. But we just can't read it as you would read a, a New York Times article. So, I, but I, so then I guess how, how do you make those choices? How do you decide in a non-arbitrary way which bits of it are truly historical, yeah. which bits of it you take on as really real, yeah. and which bits of it are um, mildly historical, and which bits are purely allegorical? Yeah. I mean, how do you make yeah. that decision? That's then? a great question. Um, I, in general, the default is to read it historically, right? For example, if they say David was a king, then his son was Solomon, right? I'd say, yes, those things really did happen. Uh, but in terms of the wisdom to understand, you have to understand, I mean, the way I'm reading the scripture is it's, it's lots and lots of authors over an incredible time period with different kinds of books. So the Psalms were written in a certain way, the Proverbs were written in a certain way, Ecclesiastes is written in a certain way, then there are um, prophetic works of Dan. So it is... Um, 
scholarship, Talmudic work, there's this incredible understanding of how certain things were written. So for example, if I write a letter to you, Dear Stuart, and I'm just saying, hey man, it was great hanging out last night. So somebody can interpret that 2,000 years ago. Hanging out? They were hanging, right? So on, right. on the other hand, you know that. Hey, it's a, Wait, it could yeah, happen. Yeah, it could happen. <laughs> right. But also says the word dear, like how dear am I to you? So you have to put it in the context of, look, that's a colloquial way people wrote letters at that time. So within that context of that, there's truth in there. Don't throw the entire letter out, but frame it in the way it was written. That's, that's all I'm trying to say, right? Don't read it verbatim, but frame it in what the medium was trying to be. I'm, I'm not sure that still at least satisfies yeah, okay. my question, which is when, how do you make the decisions that some of it you do read verbatim, some that, of it you do true. take verbatim, that's true. That's true. and other part of it you, you don't. And I, so I'll give you an example. We, yeah. Here we are in the middle of, um, I think this is an example, I hope it is. Um, <laughs> here we are in the middle of flu season. Yes. So influenza uh, is an Italian word which means influence because there was a time when people believed that unseen celestial forces influenced our health and caused illness. We clearly don't believe that anymore. We all go get flu shots because we know that it has nothing to do with unseen celestial forces. At the same time, we all believe that unseen celestial forces govern the tides of the ocean. Mm. We do believe that. Mm. And that indeed is true. Mm. How do we make that distinction? So I think science, of course, makes the distinction between those two yes. celestial influences yes. of unseen forces. Yes. I think it's much more difficult to make that decision in religion. Where Absolutely you're... true, my friend. And this is why I'm talking about the messiness, right? So here's the way I view, gosh, here's the way I guess I view a liberal arts education, right? So imagine you have, uh, imagine you have life, right? in the messiness of That's what it is. kind of a long, okay, I'll <laughs> right? give it a shot. <laughs> I'm a mathematician, you have to worry about my knowledge, right? it's awful, but I think, what, I think what we do from the mathematical world is we deal with the clean, the sterile things of the world. For example, there's a book by uh, Charles Taylor, an amazing theologian and sociologist. The book is called The Secular Age, 900 pages, the hardest book I've ever read in my life. 200 pages are devout, devoted to defining what secular means. Now, as a mathematician, like, the hardest definition will take like, you know, this may be this long, right? And first I was thinking, dude, this guy needs, he needs an editor to kind of <laughs> tighten it up, right? <laughs> and then I realized, to my own shame, that the stuff I deal with in math is actually the easy stuff. Right? We're actually dealing with the cleaned up parts of the animal. We're talking about just the bones. Just, there's nothing there left. We're talking about sterile instruments in mathematics. And I love it. I find it totally sexy. But then you go into sociology and you're dealing with things that are, well, well that's a separate, but anyway. Uh, okay. Then you go into sociology and issues of biology, you're getting more and more complex. And as you involve sociology, anthropology, now you're involving humanity and history. Now you go into the arts, you go into music, and there you're, you're, dealing with, uh, you're dealing with sort of the rawness of what it is. An artist isn't trying to, you know, you can't outline what an artwork is in terms of three or four definitions, right? And moreover, I think in the math side, who we are as a person is disconnected with the stuff we study. For example, if you come and prove to me, hey, Sathya, man, you know those three origami folds? There are four of them. You missed it. Okay, my ego would be hurt, and I'd maybe look at the math again, but my identity as a human won't be shattered. Whereas if you go to an artist who's trying to explain to them, trying to give a performance piece, and you say, dude, that sucks, right? Their identity is wrapped up in that thing. So you're right, it is messier when you go into religion and faith, messier when you go into history, and science doesn't deal with that. To me, that's, that doesn't mean I'm only going to go to science because it's the easy way out. I have to pay the price and go here. I'm not sure I agree with you about that okay. entirely. I mean, I mean, I actually think that the great thing about science is just how messy it is, actually. It's a real mess, in fact, <laughs> um, day to day, yes. and even long term. I mean, in the, and I, I will admit to you that this is not the way we teach science, mm -hmm. which is a crime. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. We teach science in some sort of a frozen textbook, yes. mummified idea that doesn't yes. look messy at all, exactly. and looks like it's all settled. But that's a crock, frankly. You know, so. So that's a distorted view of it that's common, admittedly, but, but I think a distorted view, what's wonderful about science is its messiness, is the arguments. I mean, you'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. Well, you wouldn't be surprised. You know the arguments you have with reviewers, with, yes. <laughs> you know, sometimes they're bull sessions and sometimes they're grant proposals, but that's what we do is we argue about right. all of these things. And because it's largely about the unknown, it's of necessity, it seems to me, 
quite messy. Yes, the tools can be nice and clean. The tools can be okay. refined. That's, fair. That's true. And mathematics in particular is wonderful at that and having sort of, I agree, pared away some. But yes. you know, then you try and apply it and you realize, yes. well, you need a bit of a fudge factor here and we need That's a constant right. over here. I mean, but constant was once explained to me, the purpose of a constant in an equation is it's the sum total of everything we don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> and it works out to be some number of tools. Right. Stick it in there, you know. So. <laughs> That's true. So, that's um, so true. even that's quite messy, that's it right. seems to me. Um, and, and that's one of the, the nice things about it. And I will go this far with you on that. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I, I'm a believer that science is, maybe this takes us into another area. I believe, I'm a believer that science doesn't let itself be messy enough. Yes. And maybe it could learn a little bit mm. of that from religion. Although I think religion doesn't let itself be messy I enough agree. either. I agree. I, so let me say one thing about reading scripture, because you asked me about that. So. In, um, when King David dies, right, King David is probably the greatest king in the, in the Jewish faith, right? Uh, representative in so many ways of how God loves his people through that king. When King David dies, his last two words, I mean, his last two sentences are basically, he turns to his son Solomon and he says, make sure you de don't let their old heads go to the grave without being covered in blood. So he's talking about these two guys that he never had a chance to do a mafia hit on because he <laughs> promised them. And he's telling his son, in wisdom, my son, take him out for me. Right? <laughs> now, to me, let's look, let's look at Can we go that. back to the ethics part of yeah, this Yeah, let's do it. I mean, so, exactly. No, this is all wrapped up in this thing, right? So to me, I look at this and I go, this is God's, you know, king, right? So there's two ways to answer this. One, was this the literal last thing David said? Because in scripture, it says, the next sentence is, then King David died. So you can take it literally and he goes, my son, and, like, and then that's it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Most likely, this is the work of the authors, making yep. it to emphasize the fact that even in the last thing, David is a broken man, that even then he doesn't have his heart perfectly to God again, and yet call that God calls him his chosen one. So to me, I'm not reading it literally in that sense that is his last breath, but I am reading it in the sense that King David did say those words. So that's what I mean by when I'm reading scripture. So right. we could spend a long time in terms of exactly how to do this thing, but there is a sense of truth in there, but to say that is exactly his last words, I don't think that's the point of the author. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. So how does, that, how does that relate to the messy part of it, though? Well, for example, to, so who decides? So who decides that wasn't his last word, right? For example, so you need to read this as a work of literature, as a work of understanding of what the context of it was, as what the author's intentions were. Those are difficult things to do. And exactly as science is messy because of so many, you know, how does the nose affect the ear? Affect, you know, there's incredible complications that we were just talking about over dinner. Those kind of complications also travel in the religious faith. And as you're saying, to take those at face value and drink it straight up is a dangerous thing. And I do encourage, and I do want people to encourage and wrestle with it and say, hey, this is a work of literature. At the same time, a work of history. Let's chew on it. Let's see if it holds water. But so curiously, both establishments, in a way, the establishment of science and the establishment of religion, work against that kind of messiness, it seems to me. I mean, you yes, as an individual yes, may yes. be clever enough to see otherwise, personally, for yourself, but that's not really the way they kind of work, is it? They work I, very hierarchically and very authoritarian. Yeah, I think it could just be us. In other words, I don't, I'm not sure if it's the institutions necessarily, but you know, as people, we just like to fall into a rut, well, yeah. you know, those kind of, and just let it go, right? So it, it does take somebody to stir it up once in a while and say, pull, pull yourself out of this thing. So I guess I would only say that for me, yes. science is better at stirring it up. Mm. That's Science fair. is better at keeping the pot stirred because that's what it does. That's yeah. what it always wants to do. That could be fair. Opportunity is only in the stirred pot in science. So for that, I, I, okay. I like it as a place to go kind of thing. Well, uh, let me see if I can stir things up a little okay. bit more. And turn to the, uh, the subject of suffering. And there's someone in this audience tonight who is suffering profoundly. And my question is, what would your outlook lead you to say to him that could give his suffering meaning? You're looking at me. <laughs> I'm looking at both of you. Could you, could you just say the very first, there's somebody sure, in the audience. Sure, somebody in this audience tonight is going through oh, going profound through suffering. suffering. What would you say to him? Well, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I could take a crack at it first. And, Please. Um, 
I think if any, this kind of goes back to my last quote about life is pain. If anybody gives a cheap answer to this and says, oh, there's, a, you know, it's because of X, Y, or Z, and here's what you should do, I think that's absolute silliness. I think if one of the, one of the things you read in Scripture over and over again is not the fact of whether, if you look at any great men or women of faith in Scripture, you realize that it's not whether they believe in God or not. That's never the issue. It's God. I am here. Where are you? If you look at crack scripture right in the middle, you get to the book of Job. The definition of a man who never worried about God's existence. Job never said, and thus there's no God. He basically says, there is a God who doesn't care. Kill me now. Right? And so that's the big issue is, to me, I would say, yeah, I believe there's a God. And then the fair question to ask is, if he is so good and so powerful and so strong, where is he? Which is the question people have asked throughout the ages in scripture. And uh, there's no cheap answer to that. There's no easy answer to that. My only answer to it is God understands that. And, uh, and he did it. In other words, he experienced the greatest suffering imaginable. He walked like us. He died worse than us. And, uh, and that is, <laughs> to me, to say that the, the God of creation, the God who made all of us, is now one of us, taking the, taking the blame for us and understanding what we're going through. That gives me incredible comfort to know that that is real. Um, again, that doesn't make our suffering easy, but uh, it gives us a different perspective. Stu? Well, uh, you know, I guess I, I'm Jewish, so I'd be more worried about somebody who's really ridiculously happy <laughs> out there. <laughs> I think they're in deeper trouble, frankly. I'm not asking if you're worried. I'm asking what you'd say to him. I see. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, so I, that may sound glibber than I really mean it to sound, I'm sure. Um, I'm not sure that there is a difference, really, uh, that, that for somebody who's suffering, they'll be happy at some point, and for somebody who's happy, they'll suffer at some point, rightly or wrongly, by some judicial perspective or moral perspective. And I don't know that there's meaning to be had by either of those things, but I don't I don't feel an emptiness if there is no meaning to those things. I don't really feel that suffering has to have a meaning, nor does happiness have to have a, a, a deeper meaning. They are. Uh, the world is that sort of place. It's a bit unpredictable. Things happen to us. Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. And I don't have to worry about why bad things happen to good people and things like that. I mean, that's the way... That's the way an unpredictable world kind of works. And that may sound, I don't know, um, at sea somehow or another, but I, don't, I at least personally don't feel that way. I, I kind of think it sort of evens out most of the time in one way or another. And you can have an attitude towards how bad you feel or how good you feel, and the more sensible your attitude is towards that, the happier you'll be in general, even with suffering, I think. Although there are great sufferings for which I can't imagine what you could say, I don't care what it is, I don't think you could say, well, this is for the greater good. I, I just, I don't believe that would really help. So am I hearing you saying that, Sethian, you've got a, a, an empathic God, but one simply has to accept that that's pretty much all one can hope for by way of consolation. And Stuart, you're saying, sorry, that's about all there is to say, you're suffering. I think so. I mean, in some ways, I, I guess I think we give, um, we worry too much about suffering and or happiness, the same, you know, which are flip sides, I suppose, of the same coin. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really understand what the worry about them is, I guess. In a way, I'm saying I, I kind of don't know. It's not worry. The it's it's <laughs> how would you care for someone who is, comes to you and says, I'm in desperate pain right now? Well, I guess another, maybe a way of phrasing it could also be, as you were mentioning, Stuart, is like a notion of justice. Right? Like, yeah. maybe the suffering comes from an incredible injustice done to them. You know, something done to their child, something done to their parents. And you say, I wish this was set right. You know? Yes, and so one could hope to set it right. One could try and live the kind of life that, that is helpful to people when you have that opportunity, when you can help them. To not help someone, to turn away someone who's suffering, I think would be not something that most people do, whether they're religious or not. I don't think... That, that pushes you one way or the other. I think empathy is something we can all experience and do experience. It's one of the things that kind of, well, other animals experience empathy too, it's pretty clear. 
So this is a kind of a biological principle somehow or another. Maybe it's a principle that grows up in a world that, that is otherwise quite unsympathetic to these uh, you know, crummy little carbon units that run around on this little ball of dirt here. And <laughs> I want to uh, make sure we have adequate time for uh, questions. So let me uh, invite uh, audience members to uh, prepare to uh, ask questions. Um, uh, I believe there may be a mechanism for doing that by text, and mm -hmm. if there is, if I could get a little uh, yeah. advice on how to do that. Yeah. This thing going to start it's buzzing in right my pocket. There, right? uh, there, we got oh, it up there. there. Okay, let me see. I'm the last oh. to know. Um, if you would like to ask your question to the speakers, feel free to text 646-504-2027. Oh, Does that include me? Can I? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I got a question. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, while that's going on, let me uh, uh, put one, one other question to you. Um, I'm curious about, science, about um, something I read about the Pew Research Center in 2009. Uh, they came up with two rather odd findings in a uh, survey of scientists in faith. First, they found that scientists are roughly 10 times more likely uh, to be atheists than the general public. Second, they found that 51% of scientists do believe in God, a universal spirit, or a higher power. What do you make of that? What should we make of that? Does it matter? Those numbers don't sound right. Yeah. <laughs> How can they be 10 times more likely to be atheists, but more than half of them believe in the... That means that there's... Um, does that work? <laughs> You're the mathematician, can't you? I was hoping you'd go first. <laughs> I mean, those numbers just sound at odds with each other, I guess, but um, I, I, there's the chart, oh God, a chart. <laughs> percent who believe in God, percent, percent who don't believe in either, percent, all right, well, I guess there's a chart, you can't argue with it. <laughs> Can't argue with a chart. Score one so. for the Westport Connecticut <laughs> school system. So, um, okay. S so, the, okay. Uh, scientists, I think, come in lots of different flavors, so I don't know what to make, actually, of numbers yeah. like this. I think, um, you know, Physicists and mathematicians are different from biologists, yes. and certain kinds of bio evolutionary biologists are different from molecular biologists, who are different from field biologists. Um, yeah. So it's hard to make, I think, generalizations about any population right. like this. Um, you could probably say something about chefs and their religion. I don't know. Mm -hmm. They do believe in God, they don't. This dish failed because I didn't, you know, <laughs> whatever. So, so I'm not really sure what to make of it. Uh, as I said earlier, I personally, as a scientist, find it much harder uh, to brook science and faith, religious faith. I, I find them uh, not at odds in an aggressive or impossible Richard dawkins -y kind of way, where it's a one or the other and that's it. Um, I don't think that's the case at all, and I can see people having a modicum of faith and a modicum of science, and certainly there are plenty of people of faith who seem to believe pretty much in science. I mean, people who populate our churches, synagogues, mosques, and so forth, who nonetheless all own an iPhone and use science and would go to the doctor to be cured and all of those sorts of things. So, so that's, I don't, I don't think there's a, a divide there either necessarily, um, not one that we can put our finger on easily. I'm good, yeah. Okay, uh, no comment? No, that sounds great. Okay, you agree with that? I agree. Okay, cool. Cool. <laughs> See, we've come to common ground. So I now have um, questions for, uh, for you, for, uh, early questions from the, uh, from the audience. Oh, good. Um, the first one is for, for you, Satyan. Um, even if we concede that religion can answer questions that science cannot, what do you have to say about religious claims that go against scientific law, like miracles and Jesus' resurrection, et cetera? Hmm, interesting. Uh, what do I have to say about religious claims that go against science? I don't think those claims go against science at all. I think science says, here are the laws that the world operates in. But if I just look at Genesis, um, just the beginning of it, it says, and God said, and God said. So basically, God is interacting. God is transforming. God is participating. God is... Um, yeah, God is involved in, in, the whole, in the whole process of what we live. So 
I wouldn't say, I'm not one who says that God created the world and let the game go. Uh, in fact, the Jewish notion of God is one of a sustainer, which is a pretty ballsy statement. Here's what it says. It says that if God isn't actually consciously involved in thinking about his creation, it doesn't even exist. That's a pretty amazing claim, right? So to me, I wouldn't say that somehow God lets it go and once in a while there are these miracles. I think God is a participatory player in this game. In fact, he adores his creation so much. In fact, if I look at scripture, I look at it this way. In the beginning, God created everything. It was awesome. Man came about. It was great, but then he disobeyed God. And the rest of the book, Genesis 3 all the way to the end, is about God chasing after man. And to say that somehow God is disconnected from this place with miracles, I don't buy that at all. I think he's completely involved in his creation. He cares about it and pursues it. Um, I'll move right along then, please, to uh, Stuart. Here's a, another one. Um, if there is no God, do the cares of human beings have cosmic significance? I'm sorry, could you say the first part? Sure. If there is no God, do the cares of human beings have cosmic significance? Um, do the cares of human beings have cosmic significance? I, I, I don't... I don't know whether they do or not. Um, I can easily imagine they don't. I'm not even sure what having cosmic significance would, it, would entail. It sounds a little frightening, actually. <laughs> um, if things I cared about had cosmic significance, I'd kind of be God, <laughs> it seems to me. So I, I don't know. I'd be a little afraid to care about things then. Um, I, I don't really know. I don't think that you... Uh, Hash, I don't worry about having cosmic significance. I'd be, I'd be quite happy to, be, to have some significance among the people that I interact with on a regular basis. I'd love to be significant to students. That'd be fabulous. Nothing happened, but it'd be fabulous. <laughs> I can wish. <laughs> um, I would love to be significant to, to mankind, to the animal world in some way or another. All those things are ways that I can judge my significance and many times fail, occasionally succeed, or succeed in a modicum. I wouldn't even know how to judge my cosmic significance. I, I don't really know what that would be. I'm going to uh, uh, go right into uh, additional questions. Uh, this one is for both of you. Uh, what do you think the role of free will is in determining one's choices in life? From the neuroscience perspective, can we make conscious decisions outside of the biology of the brain? And, from the religious perspective, what is the ultimate underlying force of a person's decisions? Was this person listening or just writing that question? My goodness. <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> it would have taken me all day to write that yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll Something? take a crack at it. Um, so from the religious perspective, how does free will fit into that person's a bigger, I guess, cosmic understanding of all these things, right? So, um, gosh, you know, in the Jewish, I think in the Jewish mind, there's an, inc there's an incredible comfort with tension. And certainly for us in the West, certainly in the enlightened West, we always like to break tension. You know, you have to pick one or the other one. In the Jewish mind, it's, um, when I talk about the Jewish mind, I'm talking about, you know, issues in scripture, issues in the Second Temple era and earlier. It is completely okay to say that God is absolutely in control of everything, and we're the ones making choices. And for us, we'd like to say, whoa, whoa, whoa wait. who's doing what? You know, pick, is, if God's really in charge of it, if he's the creator, that he basically rigged the system up so you have no free will. Well, there's truth in that. But at the same time, they say, well, but we're the ones God has made as stewards of this kingdom. We are, we're made in this image, which means we do, whatever we do, we represent God in doing on earth. We are many gods that God, you know, we're many representatives of him on earth. And, uh, and there we have choices, and we could represent him incorrectly. So I'd say the answer is both. We are absolutely accountable for what we do wrong. It is our choice to do it. But at the same time, God is in charge of everything. Stuart? So it's really interesting. Curiously, I could say the same thing without using the word God, I mm -hmm. think. Hmm. Um, cool. I think I could say that... that <laughs> I think. That's cool. <laughs> if I can remember what you said, I try. Um, in the sense that I believe as a biologist, in a purely mechanistic viewpoint of biology, I believe biology is fundamentally physics and chemistry, yes. that our brain is a chemical factory up here, that it does not, there's nothing about it that doesn't obey the laws of physics and chemistry in some deep way, and therefore it must in some sense be deterministic. Mm. It must be that you could know it. 
you, somebody could know it, somebody could work it out, some evil scientist could control it or whatever kind of thing goes on. At the same time, it's perfectly clear to me that we do in fact make um, decisions for which we have responsibility. I'm not one of these people who believes that there's an evolutionary, post hoc evolutionary explanation for why we do crappy things and why we shouldn't punish people for this or that. I don't, I, I don't know what the jurisprudence of it all ought to be or what's proper that way, but I don't think that's an excuse. Yes. So I would say that I think, um, I would say human beings are unquestionably a product of evolution, mm -hmm. but they're not only a product of evolution. Interesting. Um, and that that's the, the difference. So it's totally deterministic and yet there's free will. And I don't know how you make sense of that. You just awesome. have to worry about that. It's true. Um, cool. <laughs> another one for both of you. Do you think there's such a thing as unknowability with a capital U? And if so, what is unknowable and why? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what, how else could I answer that? <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you the three things we don't know. Right? Uh, um, yeah. yeah. You know three. I yeah, know right. two. <laughs> I, I mean, to me, in, in one sense, I find, look, just going back as a scientist and what I love, I think there's, both of us would certainly agree, there's a rush, you know, a literal, like a, like a rush in finding new ideas, right, and seeing how things work. And, uh, and there's a joy in it, things clicking, right? You, you never saw the ear that way, the nose that way, the math that way, the origami folding that way. And all of a sudden, wow, that's gorgeous. These results, Gauss Bonnet, right? It's like, I did not, wow, that's gorgeous. On the other hand, once you have that thing, I think it, you know, it breeds lots of new questions. The moment you come up with something that you just found, the next thing is, wow, there are 10 things now I don't even know. Mm -hmm. And that sense of unknowing and the sense of at the same time finding out my faith would say that that is a shadow of what heaven is going to be like. That God is, we will never be God, right? We are always his creation. And he's, he's invited us to hang out with him forever and just have a party. And, uh, and at that time, I will do amazing math. And I will learn cool things. And I will realize more amazing things I didn't even know. And, so, and at the same time, I will know more about God himself. I don't think when... When this world ends and the true redemption of this entire earth and heaven happen, that I will know God fully. I don't think so at all. I think every day I'll get to know a little bit more of him and I'll say, dude, that is ridiculous. That's awesome. And the next day I'll know a little bit more. I think the, the things I love about science, the things I love about math are shadows of that thing that I don't know. And that is the you that I don't understand, that I keep pursuing to know. But, but so does that mean that there's, an, uh, that there's a, an ultimate unknowability because of quantity, because we'll never run out of unknowable stuff? Or well, what I took to be a deeper question Wait, you're not here, supposed to be asking is, these questions, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's fair. That's, no, no, um, what, I, yeah. what I took to be a deeper part yeah. of that question, which is, yeah. are there things, even if we knew everything that this yes. piece of jelly up here could know, yeah. there's some things it could never know. There are just some things beyond its cognitive capacities. I, I think it's both. To me, I would say it's both. In, this, in the sense that we are never going to be God himself. We are never, so thus, we can only be limited by our, our created, you know. No, I don't know what the limitations of man's created notions are. I mean, we're just shadows of what we think we are. We keep getting better yeah. in understanding, right? But at the same time, from a pure nerdy scientific way, we keep knowing new, I mean, we keep asking new questions we never would have asked before. So that's what I find remarkable, yeah. as I think I said in the opening, is that I don't believe this Haldane statement anymore that the world is, the universe is stranger than we can imagine. Yes. We seem to have an unlimited capacity yes. for imagining the most ludicrous things yeah. possible, and then they come to be true. Yeah, absolutely. So, I just want to make good on my challenge to you to go out there and try this at home. And I'd like to just share with you two quick thoughts about how you might want to do that, maybe even over coffee after this is over tonight. The first is um, make sure it's a safe conversation. Make sure that at the beginning, and certainly in the middle, and certainly at the end, that, that you, you start and end as friends and that you are intentional about that. One good way in the middle of this to, to have a real conversation that gets deeper but that really is respectful and kind is to periodically check back and say, wait a minute, let me make sure I understand what you're saying. Is this what you are saying? And I challenge you to see if periodically you can get the other person to say, exactly, that's what I'm saying. And if you're successful at that, if you can get it several times, then I would suggest you're actually having a safe and penetrating conversation. If you keep missing each other, that might be a sign it's time to take a break. 
Okay. So with that, let me invite um, each of you to uh, give a closing thought. Let's see, we started with, with you, Stuart, so um, why don't we start with you to... Uh, <laughs> that seems arbitrary. Conclude? Okay, that's fine. Well, I'm with Satya. Either way. Do okay. you want me to start? Um, how can I wrap this up? I've had a wonderful time tonight. I hope nobody has actually changed their mind because what's really important in all of this is the plurality of minds, the plurality of views, the many ways that things can be seen. I'm a firm believer in the scientific way of seeing things. Not, I want to point out in the scientific method, which I don't believe in at all, um, but in the scientific way of seeing things. Uh, I think it, it's our best hope for the future. It's our best hope uh, for the planet. It can also be the, the end of the planet. God knows we're also good at that. Um, but I think if you, if you want to know something deeply uh, and you want to know about what we don't know, if you want to know about the borders of our knowledge, the great unknown parts of it, the real mysteries, then science is just the biggest playground we've ever come up with. And that we came up with it is remarkable. If I were religious, I would say science is the greatest gift that God has given us. But I'm not religious. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, there's a story I like to tell. I just want to close with one of my favorite stories. It's a, it's a story about Karl Barth. I'm not sure if you know who he is. Karl Barth is probably one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century and uh, spent all his life studying about the Judeo-Christian faith, uh, an amazing expert, um, superstar. And he was coming out of church one day, and a, and a famous astronomer catches up to him and says, Professor Barth, you know, isn't it true that all of religion is trying to say the same thing. I mean, the Christian, the, like, like, isn't the whole point of this whole thing called religion? Isn't it all about just saying, do good unto others as you would have them do unto you? It's not the punchline. What do you guys have all this stuff fluffed around for? Karl Barth thought about this. He spent, you know, his entire life focusing on this one, one faith and pouring his heart into it. He goes, turns to the astronomer and he says, you know, isn't it true that all of astronomy can also be summarized by a phrase? <laughs> the astronomer is taken back. You're kidding me, right? Black holes, the curvature of space and time, general and special relativity. What is this one phrase that can encompass all of this? And Karl Barth says, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder where you are. <laughs> and so the point is, we can come up with these short phrases, right? All religion is one. The point of this is this. But my friends, there's incredible depth to these great thoughts. There's incredible depth. I think science is beautiful and it has a tool to offer to understand it. But I think so does literature and so does music and so does art and so does faith. All of these things are important and I encourage you to pursue them.